here to speak with Toby Negrin, the Chief Product Officer for the Wikimedia Foundation. Many of you know Toby. Toby has worked at the foundation for nearly eight years. He has almost 20 years of experience integrating data, research, and design to support free knowledge projects. Audrey is known for revitalizing the computer languages Perl and Haskell, as well as building the online spreadsheet system EtherCalc in collaboration with Dan Bricklin. In the public sector, Audrey served on the Taiwan National Development Council's Open Data Committee and the 12-year 12, 12 Basic Education Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project. In the private sector, Audrey worked as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics, with Oxford University Press on crowd lexic lexicography, and with social text on social interaction design. In the social sector, Audrey actively contributes to GovZero, a vibrant community focusing on creating tools for, the, for civil society with the call to fork the government. After Audrey and Toby talk, we'll open up to questions from all of you. I'll collect your questions through the Q&A function of the Google Meet. Um, you can find it by clicking on the icon of the three shapes in the top right of the screen next to your self view. Uh, you can leave questions and upload them there anytime during the talk. Uh, and then during the q and I'll share the most popular questions with our speakers. So without further ado, um, let's hand it over to Audrey and Toby. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, Audrey, I, um, this, is a, this is actually a super exciting um, night for me. Um, thank you so much for, for speaking with us. Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, walk across the street for LeBron James, but it's incredibly exciting to meet uh, one of my heroes from the Pearl days, um, um, as well as someone who has contributed so much to the to the ideas that make Wikipedia what it is. So, so thank you very much for coming. It is really, it is really. I'm sort of I'm sort of nervous. Thank you. So, um, just to get us started, uh, you've had a fascinating journey. Um, career journey as a hacker, an entrepreneur, an open source pioneer, to becoming the youngest ever cabinet member in Taiwan. Um, what advice do you have for engineers and technologists who want to do more work that is mission and purpose driven? Um, and sort of as a as a Perl nerd, how is your you know how's your experience with open source communities um, affected how you uh, viewed your role in government? With the government. With the government. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I don't work for the government. So anyway, um, I think the, the point here is uh, working with the people, not for the people, right? That's the original idea of open source. Um, previously, the free software movement uh, is about human rights. It's about the digital rights and dignity and so on. And open source uh, flips that around and tells the um, companies, organizations that have a lot of bureaucracy saying, you know, and it's actually better if you work with um, the citizens, the participants, not treating them as just users or consumers. Users being, you know, a, a preferred term in some other addictive industry that I try not to use. Um, and so um, the, the philosophy here of working with not for um, carries directly to the government. And uh, my role uh, is um, a minister at large. And in my office, there's more than 12 secondments uh, from all the different ministries. Each have their own value, of course, uh, but we can build shared values out of those different perspectives. And again, this is something we learn from open source community. It's called open multi-stakeholderism. Right? People can argue very passionately about the position they believe in, but uh, our work is to produce good enough consensus uh, or rough consensus. Um, in, for, for example, uh, when we're working on counter the pandemic uh, with no lockdown so far, uh, less than 20 deaths uh, for, for Taiwan, uh, and countering the infodemic uh, with no takedown, we have on-site um, people. For example, I work very closely, like sitting next to me is our Minister of Health, Secondment, uh, who was a contact tracer from the SARS days in 2003. So she knows a lot about context tracing and about public health and epidemiology and so on, and also have frontline experience. So when we design those digital systems, we're not saying, oh, the context tracer should work uh, for our digital system. It's the other way around. We need to work with the contact tracer. So each system we develop reduce their risk, reduce the time spent, and builds mutual trust. Hmm. Um, 
How, what made you decide to uh, work with with the government as sort of your 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 next next challenge? Uh, we we occupied a parliament, so we kind of invited ourselves in uh, in twenty fourteen March uh, as part of the sunflower movement. Uh, we occupied the legislature um, for twenty two days. Um, at the time, uh, the legislature, the MPs, were refusing to deliberate substantially a trade agreement with Beijing regime. Uh, and what I did, um, and many other people in the GovZero movement did, uh, was essentially demonstration, not as in protest, but as in demo, like uh, demoing uh, when the MPs were on strike, uh, how people, half a million people on the street and many more online can take their place quite literally, um, and with good uh, open source crowdsourcing tools, making sure that we can't get a good enough consensus. And we did. After 22 days, we set on 40 months, not one less. And these are agreed by the head of the parliament. So the Occupy was a success. And it effected uh, a widespread deliberation practice on aspects of the trade agreement. For example, one of the 20 or so NGOs is focused on uh, whether we allow PRC-based components in our then new 4G infrastructure infrastructure. So it's like the conversation that everybody was having in the past couple of years, uh, just uh, six mm -hmm. years earlier. <laughs> and then, um, the, the conversation was again crowdsourced, it sets a social norm. And so this norm based um, policy deliberation is quite new, it's actually almost impossible to do without uh, modern live streaming technology, broadband as a human rights and other underlying conditions. Uh, but we proved that it works. Uh, and so at the end of that year, 2014, all the mayors that supported open government gets elected sometime uh, actually surprising to them. Uh, and the people who did not support the occupiers, they don't get elected as mayors. And so the public service just uh, work with us then. Uh, we work as reverse mentors um, that are maybe young, but pair with the existing minister to show them the art of processing. Yeah, awesome. And and, and folks who, who haven't had a chance to learn about the uh, Sunflower Movement, I would, I would check it out it's 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 really interesting um kind of amazing so um minister when i was um when i was doing some research for this call um thanks thanks dan when i was doing some research for this call i was i was watching one of your one of your ted talks and and it was just like there were like four or five great ideas that i wanted to try like today at at wikipedia but one of the most interesting ones to me was was gov.0 and this sort of notion of sort of you know having like like sort of flipping the government around could could you talk a little bit more about gov0 and just sort of give folks an idea of what what's what's happening there definitely so gov0 or g0v.tw has this great slogan and pasting this here and it says <clears throat> ask not why nobody is doing something you are that nobody. So basically, um, the idea is that when people complain about something from the government works badly or is missing. Um, in Taiwan, the government websites always ends in something that GOV, that TW, uh, well, in your jurisdiction as well, right, with a different country code. Um, and Gov0 registered this brilliant website, G0V, the TW. So, for each and every government services, like join the GOV.tw that you don't like, well, you just change your O to a zero, and then you get into join the G0V.tw, which is the shadow government, right? The, the alternate version that uh, works always uh, in a more fun way. Um, and all the Gov0 projects um, are uh, free of copyright and patent restrictions. Um, That's to say if it's the OSI and open definition when it comes to code and data. So whenever the good prototype is done in the Gov0, we can always merge them back to the government. So in Taiwan, there's no clear distinction between civic tech and GovTech. Just in the past three days, uh, Gov0 co-created a specification for a privacy-preserving, secure multi-party um, check-in system uh, based on SMS uh, for uh, contact tracing. Uh, and the spec and the reference implementation was done entirely in the social sector. But we, because this free of copyright, simply merge it back and deploy it in just 24 hours. Um, and so now it's, it's act actively running. Uh, and so this shows the ability of crowdsourcing um, and not just um, 
procurement, which is more about the government setting the agenda and getting the uh, citizens to implement it for a fee, right? This is what we call reverse procurement, where the citizen already set a norm. And broadly speaking, everybody already understand the norm and thinks the norm is better. But of course, the civic tech people can't really pay the ongoing maintenance price, especially penetration testing and cybersecurity. Um, and so it gets merged back. So it's forked government, that's the slogan, with the intention to merge like a soft fork. Yeah, that is that is super cool. I mean, as as Wikipedia has in, in some way, Wikipedia has in some ways I think it was sort of founded with that kind of ethos in mind, like you could really do anything. And then after after 20 years, it's become like this global global resource that that sort of there's this feeling that we have to protect it. Like, and I think we see that in some communities. And I think we sort of see that here. And I just the idea that like there could be a shadow Wikipedia that you could really sort of try to get back to sort of the roots is something that that's that's really that's really interesting in that and that your talk made me think a little bit more about because we sort of feel like we have kind of this kind of sort of this almost contradictory um mission um mm -hmm. and sort of i think the the you know thinking about sort of you know what you've done with with the government was was really really uh, kind of interesting and inspiring um is there anything you've you've learned ab about GovZero after you? I think it's it's been in operation for about five years now. Is that right? Mm, since twelve, uh, twenty twelve. So almost ten years now. Wow. So mm -hmm. any any like any any, any sort of advice or, or thoughts after doing it for a decade? So just three words: fast, fair, and fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anything that's fast and fair and fun uh, become successful social innovation um, because people remix it and the remix get instant gratification and so on. Uh, but if it's not fast or not fair or not fun, then people lose the interest and they devote their uh, time uh, elsewhere. Awesome. So um, I want to talk about. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, inclusion and belonging in, in in digital communities, which is is something that we're starting to think about more here as we start to really sort of think about how to take Wikipedia's mission from sort of the states and and parts of Asia and Europe where it's very popular and spread the mission out to the world. And so. We know technology can be used to 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 exclude or erase certain populations. What about the flip side? You know, do, do you have any? How can technology be used to increase the sense of belonging and participation? So I, I think about the various ways that people in even very low bandwidth um, situations uh, that nevertheless have good participation tools. For example, in, I believe, uh, Lisbon a few years back, they did participatory budgeting uh, using ATM. Uh, meaning that you can just use your ATM and then instead of selecting which bank account you wire to, you select uh, which budget item you would like to propose. Um, they didn't go all the way to use quadratic funding uh, where people can crowdfund use the ATM for public, <laughs> public work, <laughs> maybe because quadratic funding wasn't invented uh, yet by that time, uh, but, but it, it's, a, it's a good start. Right, uh, and I think about the SMS-based system we just rolled out, which is specifically designed for places and people who do not have a smartphone. They can't even scan a QR code, but you can just SMS to 1922, the universal toll-free number in Taiwan for pandemic control, uh, and then uh, enter the um, numbers uh, on the poster and then send, and then you finish the check-in. Um, and so uh, when we design all the workflows, I work uh, with my own grandmother. Um, she's 88 years old now, um, and uh, she serves as this great focus group leader. Um, and we make sure, for example, when we were rationing out masks, um, she introduced me to her younger friends who complain about the uh, distance from the residents of, of theirs to the pharmacies, which may be like half an hour away by public transportation. And her her younger friends, uh, such as Grandma Young here, um, is 77 years old. So uh, younger only to, to her, I guess. Uh, and then um, this, uh, this is Grandma Young. 
And we worked together then to test this ATM best uh, voting system, well, not voting system, pre ordering system, where uh, she could wire like two euros um, to the center of disease control, get a receipt, and then uh, go to the counter uh, and then get some mask uh, rationed. That was last April. And then Grandma Young said, um, you know, if you make me take my debit card out, I would rather take the bus and go back to the pharmacy for 30 uh, minutes and queue in line because uh, she was very um, anxious that people queuing after her in an ATM will see her password. Uh, and wire the entire saving of her uh, to other people, uh, to other account. Or if she mistypes something, then it goes uh, from wiring to the CDC to some other account uh, where she couldn't really recover from. So it's not uh, that simple for fast to mean um, just a safe um, space for the elderly people, for the senior people, and the people with no broadband connection. So we instead work with the universal healthcare in Taiwan, which has an IC card, and she can just insert it to the kiosk, no password needed, it's specific purpose just for pandemic control, and then pay in coin on that counter uh, for the masks. Uh, and so um, it's not always the fastest, but uh, it's what people feel most safe. And if you co-design with people so that they feel safe, their wisdom prompts the sort of ways that enabled collaboration. And she went uh, and taught her younger friends like 66 years old and so on. Nice, the, 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 the younger set. No, that's, that's, that's great. I know I, I always take our, our new product ideas to my, to my teenagers and sort of ask them, um, you know, if there's too much reading or if it's boring and they, 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 they never fail with the honest feedback. So, yeah. And I think on, on a more serious note, I think like we've come, we've come to realize that the experiences for, for the rest of the world are not going to be designed from San Francisco or London. Like we need to have like the folks who we need to admit, they need to be created in the context of the people who are using them. And we're, you know, moving, a lot of our product development out, you know, into into Asia and and Africa to uh, really try to live that. But um, that's great. So, so I um I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic since since you brought it up and and as you said, Taiwan's had really an incredible response and 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 you've actually been being a big part of that. So I wanted to talk to ask you about some of the sort of open source inspired um, mm -hmm. mask uh, campaigns that mm -hmm. that that you've done in, in mm -hmm. Taiwan. And can you talk a little bit about those? Sure, certainly. So uh, the mask campaign uh, began uh, last January. Uh, around the end of January, uh, a couple public health experts visited the cabinet office and shared their numeric models, um, Professor Fan Tai and Chen Yixuan. And according to their models, uh, and um, to everyone who have played uh, the uh, Plague Incorporated, uh, especially the Cure Mode, uh, this will feel very familiar. Uh, their model says, if you get 75% of people wearing masks and washing hands uh, uh, in all neighborhoods, then the R value would be under one for the uh, new SARS variant, SARS 2.0, as we call it. Um, but if you don't have that uh, evenly distributed in all neighborhoods, then the neighborhoods that has less than 75 uh, mask uh, adoption will get an R value above one, and then you cannot avoid a, a community spread, a, a exponential growth. So once we realized that um, last January, then we immediately began to work to ration the mask, because at the time, we only produced about 2 million uh, medical masks per day, but Taiwan has a population of 23 million people. So, so rationing is, is the only way. Um, and instead of using mobile payment or whatever, we just use the health card. And the health card is um, in service of also immigrant workers, um, you know, foreign people who do not have citizenship, but they nevertheless enjoy universal health care. So they know it's actually cheaper to get the mask to get to a clinic, to get a full diagnosis if they develop COVID-like symptoms is cheaper than a single RT-PCR test in any other country. Um, and so uh, because of that, there's no financial or social burden uh, to get those ration masks and, and report to the clinic. However, um, people did not know which pharmacy have some masks and which did not. And so a bunch of civic tech people in the GovZero channel co-created what we call the mask rationing map. 
And the map, very simply put, allows people to queue in line and on their phone, more than 100 different tools display the real-time mask availability in the nearby pharmacies. So they can see the persons queuing before them, swiping the IC card and see in real time, um, a couple of minutes later, uh, this number would drop. Uh, and so if it run out of mask, it becomes gray or red, if it's dangerously low in stock. And so people can go to a slightly farther, but um, fully stocked pharmacy uh, for the masks. And so it enables the very fair distribution. And because we trust citizens with real-time open data or open API, this means that all the pharmacies, uh, more than 90% of them have a fiber optic connection back to the National Health Insurance Administration. And so because of that, the number is quite accurate and enable people to analyze uh, independently uh, to get the distribution mechanism fixed. Uh, in particular, we have someone uh, from our parliament, MP Gao Hongan. Uh, she was VP of data analytics at Foxconn Group. So she knows something about data uh, and understatement. Uh, and uh, behind her uh, is the interpolation screen uh, in our parliament. Uh, and uh, people may recognize that as OpenStreetMap. Um, and in fact, it's the Jiu Ping An system that the Taiwan company developed. They work often with the UN system for humanitarian aid, like during the Nepal earthquake and so on, which I believe uh, Wikipedia and OpenStreetMap uh, humanitarian workforce also work with Taiwan people to crowdsource um, the recognition uh, of the uh, satellite images. And so the community analyzed that and showed that we had a data bias, actually, because we used to say, according to the GovZero map here, uh, we see the population centers almost align perfectly with the mask availability and pharmacies. So we think it's a fair distribution, 75%, why not? Uh, but MP Gao with the community of OpenStreetMap said, no, it's not true because not everyone own a helicopter. So what looks like fair and the distance on the map is not the same when people have to spend time on public transportation. So it's actually heavily biased because people in rural areas have to pay a, um, a a disproportionate uh, time cost in order to access it. And so she suggested a better rationing method uh, and uh, suggest that we uh, do pre-ordering and work with some vending machine uh, vendors uh, to help the pre-ordering to happen. Uh, and that worked really, really well. Uh, and so she said, um, yesterday's interpolation become tomorrow's co-creation because Minister Chen Shizhong, our house minister, simply said, legislator teach us. And, and this is not possible unless we have a shared open data that's updated in real time. So by April, we reached uh, the 75% uh, in all the different districts and neighborhoods. Excellent. Wow, that's fa uh, that's fantastic. Ha is it possible to emigrate to Taiwan? Yes, uh, we have a gold card system. Uh, and we also have dual citizenship, uh, and we uh, hand out gold cards to anyone who has, and I quote, the potential to contribute to science or technology to Taiwan. Uh, and so, <laughs> and, and you enjoy universal health care too, and you can bring your family. So um, here is the gold card application checklist. <laughs> it's co-created by co gold card holders, uh, also longtime open source contributors uh, from the OpenStack, I believe, and other projects who have emigrated to Taiwan uh, and actually are dual citizens now. Uh, so feel free to join their uh, step. Awesome, thank you. I hope I have some potential, but uh, no, that's that's yeah, that's that's really cool. It's uh, I mean, it, it just say compared to the state's initial response to COVID, it it, it sounds uh, it sounds what you did is 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 pretty remarkable. Um, would you like to share some of the um, the dog pictures? Oh, okay, that, sure. That you used. I just think there are probably a few a few dog lovers here, and I just thought those were a, sort of a, a nice, lighthearted way to, to to think about the pandemic, or or not think about the pandemic, but they're cute dog pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called humor over rumor. Um, it, it's our counter infodemic nice. strategy. Yeah. So I think what was the what was the name of the dog? Uh, it's called uh, Zong Chai. It's a it's a wordplay. It's a brilliant wordplay because Zong Chai uh, means uh, like the CEO, uh, and Zong uh, Chai is Shiba. So Zong Chai is a very good Mandarin transliteration of the Doga meme. So basically, this is the the chief doga of uh, pandemic control, basically. Uh, and the dog lives with um, the participation officer of Ministry uh, of Health. 
And so I'm sure that uh, in each ministry, there's a team of people who engage the emerging hashtags full time. Uh, and we set up this system since 2016. Uh, so instead of just media officers that talk to the press or parliamentary officers that talk to the MPs, the participation officers uh, engage all the trending hashtags uh, and basically cultural jam uh, all the <laughs> um, disinformation so that the clarification is more funny uh, than the disinformation. Uh, and then uh, people will just share um, the meme as a contextualizing service. Um, that, that's the basic idea. Nice. Fantastic. Uh, Sarah, how are we doing on time? I've got a few more questions, but I definitely want to let folks um, post ask theirs. Yeah, Nate, uh, Nate and I were just uh, side chatting about that. Um, you're doing fine on time, um, and we're just trying to uh, decide on a time to wrap for questions, but you, you can keep going for now. Okay, awesome. Peter, do you want to ask the Polis question or do you want me to ask it? Um, you whatever you think's best, Toby. Well, okay, I, I'll let you, I'll let you do it because we we were chatting about it, and I've got some other ones. So, um, Minister, going back to going back to oh, okay, awesome. Well, let's just let's just let's just Peter. Do you want to ask it? I'm just going to break the break break the rules. Sorry, sorry. Sure, Peter, sure, do you, do you want to sure, ask sure. your question? Sure. Yeah, I had I had two Toby, so I'm going to ask both, and you tell me which one you were thinking of. So no, ask okay. the one we were talking about earlier, and then you can ask your other one later. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, hi, Audrey. My name is Peter, um, but I don't know if that's relevant in this context. Anyhow, uh, the question uh, related to Polis is, you know, how, if at all, has Polis and the interactions you've watched emerge within it? Um, impacted the way that you think about how communication tools um, for use in collaborative contexts should be designed. Mm -hmm. is, is that a clear question? Yes. Um, so uh, for context, uh, Polis is an AI-powered conversation tool, uh, where AI means assistive intelligence, um, because otherwise we can't really ensure that conversation emerge in a pro-social way. It may diverge and never converge, right? Um, and so using Polis for public deliberation is like setting the digital equivalent of a town hall or something, a public building for civic participation, instead of having to have a public deliberation deliberation on, say, Facebook, uh, which is like holding a town hall in a nightclub with loud music and addictive drinks and private bouncer, and you have to shout to get heard. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can do that with a lot of effort, but it's not a good use of the nightlife district. And so the point here is that uh, when we set up the police conversation, for example, on Uber, we witnessed two things immediately. First, people were quite surprised that if we simply ask for each other's feelings instead of suggestions, there's some really good, good enough consensus. The solutions may not uh, converge that quickly, but if you ask, how do you feel about all this? Then actually people feel more or less the same way. People all feel that passenger liability is very important, whether they're Uber drivers or taxi drivers in 2015. So, Instead of debating, like, let's classify it as sharing economy, let's classify it as gig economy, let's classify it as platform economy, or whatever, uh, we, we simply ask, how do you feel? Um, and so we, we call it uh, a wiki survey, um, because the survey uh, items, the polls, questions, are crowdsourced. It's not fixed, as in most other surveys. And so I think the most important picture is this one. Whereas when you ask people, uh, how do you feel about Uber? Actually, the shape is like this. But if you ask, uh, what's your suggestion of our legalization about sharing economy? It will probably flip, right? So, so the, the, the trick is to ask people how they feel. And then out of those common feelings, a lot of very clear thread uh, emerge and the com communication can become pro-social rather than anti-social. Um, and so the lack of reply button, of course, that also helps uh, the troll control, the visualization of commonalities, the uh, res resilience against um, like fake accounts. If you get 2000 people voting exactly the same way, it doesn't increase the area uh, and so on. Uh, of course, all these are standard uh, troll control measures. Um, that Wikipedia actually is the champion here. Uh, but the most important thing is to set agenda around people's feelings, not suggestions. 
Peter is actually the, the product manager for our community for our on wiki communication tools. And when I was when I was listening to your TED talk, this was one of the ideas that really resonated. Right. We're trying to I think Peter and I were chatting about this before and um, we were talking about opinionated software. And right now our software is sort of implicitly opinionated that if you know wiki text and you're good at arguing on the Internet, you should have a voice. And we'd really like to think of ways that are more representative. And I think Polis is, and there are some others, but Polis is just really interesting. And then when I saw that sort of distribution of how people how people felt, that was just really interesting. That was really interesting. And so, yeah, um, I think and Polis is an open source project, right? I think it's, it's of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, we host it um, on our own premise as well at uh, actually polis.gov.tw, which is uh, actually quite symbolic because something that gov.tw on the kind of top domain uh, means that it's a permanent structure of the public service. So basically it's digital public infrastructure, uh, but it's um, of course free software, but we also uh, contribute a lot by hiring professional penetration testers, cybersecurity auditors, uh, and providing our own like hosting environments uh, to make sure that even though uh, the development is out there in the social sector, the citizens of Taiwan can feel safe uh, for it to be part of our democratic institution. So, um, awesome. So, so sort of in, I think, sort of, um, I guess to, to sum up before we can move on to more questions, I, I wanted to run a, a theory by you, Minister, about open source and open knowledge. And, and I'm happy to, I'm, I'm happy to have you disagree. But, um, for me, like at the beginning of the century, when when Wikipedia began, sort of open source and open knowledge were sort of entwined. They were very much the same thing. And, and many of the people who were sort of the early creators of, of Wikipedia were also the people who worked on the software platform. But it feels like in some ways in 20 years, like open source and open knowledge have somehow deviated where open source in some ways seems sort of in, in, in many ways to be accepted, even co-opted by sort of major corporations, it feels like open knowledge is actually sort of more, um, sort of more radical than ever. You see with disinformation campaigns and, and, and various governments and other entities sort of poisoning the, the public discourse. I just wanted to sort of get your, get your thoughts on, on the future of open source and open knowledge. And, and, you know, sort of, is there a way to sort of bring back that, that passion that we all felt at the, at the beginning of the century? Well, when, when the term open source was coined, um, that was 97, right, 98. Uh, I was kind of part of the, that, that whole thing because yeah. we have to translate all these uh, to Mandarin. Uh, and so um, we, we discovered very quickly that open source actually could be translated as either Kai Yuan or Kai Fang Yuan Shi Ma. And the first uh, translation uh, uses the open source intelligence uh, word root. Uh, that is to say, there, there was a term open source before the open source movement, right? Um, and it means right. that the context of the intelligence uh, is from publicly available sources that could be independently checked yeah. by unrelated intelligence workers or some other definition I didn't look up on Wikipedia. <laughs> but anyway, so um, if, we, if we classify open source as providing computer code and documentation information to the open source intelligence community. Um, that naturally bridges together the two communities again, which is why I always prefer the Kai Yuan, uh, like open water source um, translation is also shorter and easier to rhyme uh, compared to uh, the open source code conversation, which made it right, code right. based and even exclude documentation folks. Interesting. So actually, and you like they are still they are still really really intertwined. If mm -hmm. you think about it, mm -hmm. if you think mm -hmm. about it, if you contextualize yeah. it as a you know source code is just one form of um, open source intelligence um, contextualizing um, um, vehicle, 
media, right? Uh, and and the, the idea of um, counter disinformation using contextualizing service, I think it's what the open source intelligence and open source development communities can both contribute because without the source code also uh, could be fact checked in a sense. Uh, you, you, you're you basically yeah. just trading one bias uh, dispelling service with another plus potentially biased service and that leads us nowhere. Right, right. So in some ways, you could think of sort of Wikipedia and references and the and the, the revision history as being like open source knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's, that's exactly have, right. Uh, and it's doubly true, of course, with with Wikidata, uh, which is by definition, yes. reusable structural data. Definitely. Interesting. That's yeah, that's good. That's something that's yeah, I guess when we always find things diverging, we should try to find a way to, to bring them bring them back together. Um, so I guess, Sarah, this is my last question. Is that cool? That is perfect, because I was just going to tell you okay. it's probably awesome. time to open up the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask a question from somebody who couldn't be on the call tonight. And then um, can for... I ask one more question, though, Sarah? Oh, oh so oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, go ahead. Ask one more I just want to do the last question. So, yes. Sarah, <laughs> sorry. sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> Minister, do you have any do you have any advice for Wikipedia or and and Wikimedia, like anything that you'd like us to be doing, or you think you know opportunities that that we're missing. I don't know. The last time I personally contributed to the to the code was during the visual editor. I contributed something like fifty lines as a contractor, uh, which was probably uh, rewritten. <laughs> so, but, but but I think I joined because I think visual editor uh, really is one of the keys, right? One of the keys to to make sure that people who are not versed in wiki text uh, has equity uh, in getting participation into the community. Um, it's also a difficult problem because um, the norm around collaborative documents like Google Doc, which is real time, uh, is quite different uh, from the kind of uh, revision based ones. So it's a, it's a hard problem. But I think uh, recently we found um, a lot of products and the local Wikimedia uh, meetups and so on kind of work around these problems quite well by making sure that for kind of Greenfield art articles uh, in a particular campaign and so on, they can use the visual first uh, or whatever first uh, yeah. norms uh, for their uh, com communication and therefore uh, are not in asking the wiki text uh, based norms uh, to be carried over, basically creating a, a more friendly norm. Um, and I think that's a pretty good thing. Um, although I'm sure that it, it costs community some tensions and so on, <laughs> but but I'm, I'm sure that uh, it expands the the base of people who feel comfortable uh, with the editor, and if people come feel comfortable with becoming the editor, then the main challenge to uh, Wikipedia or really any large organization, uh, which was of course um, more people view, much more people view, and less people contribute, and people contribute uh, become a cabal. Well, there's no cabal, but uh, anyway, <laughs> so the, the the early adopters dominating the norms that could be solved by essentially would do what Buckminster Fuller said you know, build a new system that slowly, gradually render the old system obsolete without fighting it. Yes, um, I think that's what, uh, yes, that I think that kind of exactly describes sort of our very sort of slow um, but steady like software development methodology where we really work with the existing communities and we kind of sort of nudge them towards like, hey, this mobile phone, a lot of people have them and maybe we should make it possible to edit Wikipedia on your phone, like for example. But um, yeah, so vi yeah, visual, yeah, visual editor is, uh, is, is everywhere now. So um, your, your, mm -hmm. you know, your 50, your 50 line of lines of code were, uh, were, were, were well done. So thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think the the wiki one and other kind of forks uh, is like of zero for Wikipedia uh, during the time of my participation also help a lot to popularize like alternate layout uh, inspirations for people to participate uh, from a background where monospace font was not the norm. So I think uh, you you managed the transition well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're. I mean, I, I think one one thing I think we're we're proud of here is that you know we didn't. We didn't try to 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 change things too dramatically. Like mm -hmm. we didn't sort of go against the community, and like a lot a lot of digital services, um, you know, our usage really just um, 
blew up during during the pandemic when people not only had a lot of time on their hands, but they needed good information, not mm -hmm. just about COVID, mm -hmm. but about the US election and, and, and things all over the world. And it was really gratifying to see the number of editors in particular actually go back to the levels that they were in like 2006, 2007. So that was really exciting. Um, cool, well, th thank you. Sarah, um, oh, oh, back to you, thanks. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> uh, so yes, I have a couple questions. Um, and one of them, the first one I wanna start with is um, from Claudia, she couldn't be here. So um, um, I'll share her question. Uh, um, how can democratic online communities best resist the pressures of disinformation, especially when it comes from state-backed actors? Okay. Um, I mean, that depends on how powerful is that state. Uh, sorry, <laughs> can't, can't resist that. But um, I, I mean, uh, in, in many cases, um, contextualizing service is pretty much the only viable way in democratic uh, polities. Because if you do anything else, uh, like forcing the companies to take down stuff uh, or imposing your own censorship rules uh, or whatever, then it by definition kind of make you less democratic as a polity. And that in turn decimates, like literally cut by 10%, the motivation for the social sector to contribute. Um, and then uh, the disinformation epidemic become out of control. It would be like, you know, doing lockdown all the time and people get fatigued and they do not develop the social solidarity services uh, that's required to understand the pandemic and invent new ways to manage it well. So in Taiwan, um, in addition to humor over rumor, uh, which actually is my preferred way of countering it, um, we also made sure that public participation uh, plays a large role in it. Um, the uh, average, um, do you see this? The average response time is 16 minutes when we detect a trending disinformation by people reporting to it, uh, like flagging spawn. And the contextualizing service, <clears throat> you see, um, this is the original disinformation that says perm your hair multiple times a week will be subject to $1 million fine. And then the context first said it's not true. And then our premier head of cabinet says, I may be bought now, but I will not punish people who look like my youth. Uh, and a fine print that says, uh, what we're doing is actually introduce a labeling requirement for hair products, nothing about the hair cutters. And the premier as he looks now says, However, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. Just look at me for what will happen to your hair. Very dangerous, right? So by kind of quite literally making himself uh, the butt of the joke, um, well, we have another literal one where he literally made himself the butt of a joke. Uh, we um, made sure that people remix the message. It's just hilarious. And it, it doesn't really attack anyone, right? So this context reached everyone. And so when people share then the disinformation, they're much more inclined to share this much more funny one. Uh, and then the context uh, gets shared uh, along with it. And it requires professional journalists from the International Fact Check Network it, uh, with the GovZero community, which build a COFAX um, service where people can forward, even in end-to-end -end encrypted channels, forward to the bot, which does the fact checking service to them. It required the leading antivirus company, Trend Micro, which developed another chatbot that also checks for deep fakes and visual and audio and stuff and so on. So there's a veritable ecosystem, much like what we did to counter spam. It's just this, um, you know, disinformation to spam is like SARS to flu, right? <laughs> it's basically the same thing, uh, but uh, with just a, you know, higher damage uh, and a higher R value. And for state-based uh, interference, uh, we made sure that uh, they are banned, basically, during our, um, presidential election, for example, all the political and social advertisements must only come from the uh, domestic funding sources because we treat them as campaign donations. And we did not pass any law for that. There's a strong social norm that says, if Facebook doesn't treat them as political contributions, we're going to boycott Facebook, social sanction. And so to build such a norm, I think is the most important thing. Wow, well, that's, that's super interesting. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Peter. You actually have a couple more questions, Peter. So I'm going to go ahead and let you let you ask those. That sounds good. But the caveat that I've spoken. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, 
just with the caveat that I have many questions. <laughs> yes, and, perfect. Yeah, uh, and if, if other, other people have want, questions. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Please intervene, but I will please. ask since I have the yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Audrey. One of the questions that I had was. Um, can you share some of the metaphors that shape the way you, someone who has influence over how resources are allocated, approach interacting with the public? And I ask that with kind of an acute awareness for uh, an appreciation for language. So uh, mm -hmm. that's how that question came to be. Um, so false fair fun, I shared that. Humor over rumor, right? I shared that too. Uh, and so there's uh, another quote that I rather like. Uh, and it's from our president, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, in her inauguration speech, actually, in 2016. And she said, before we think about democracy as a showdown between two opposing values, but now democracy must become a conversation between many diverse values. And, and this, like, non-binary thinking, it's, it's the most important thing. I, I my I may be like personally blessed because I've went through two puberties, so I don't have in my mind the category uh, of people closer to me and the people farther away from me, just because we you know probably share a similar puberty experience no matter your gender right, um, and uh, this applies to pretty much everything. And when people think in a non-binary way, which by the way, people sometimes challenge me saying, you're a digital minister, how can you be non-binary? I'm like, digital means like decimal, right? Digits, I have 10 digits. So basically the plurality, um, that is the most important thing. And so the metaphor that I use uh, is taking all the sides, no matter how many stakeholder groups are there, if I cannot argue uh, from their perspective, it's my fault and I will travel and spend time uh, ethnographic or just hanging out uh, until I can see things from their perspective. Mm. Awesome, thank you. Peter, I did just get another question from, um, from another person who couldn't be here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask that one and then, uh, and then let you have the, the next question if you want it. So one second. Uh, this question is from uh, Shristi, and uh, she asks, um, I read about how you addressed the mass supply, mask supply problem in the early days of the pandemic. I'm curious to know if you have any ideas or thoughts on how to solve the ongoing severe oxygen crisis in India. How can the problem in India be solved in similar or different ways? Yeah, when it comes to distribution, um, India, the digital infrastructure uh, with Adha, uh, with all its uh, privacy concerns and so on, uh, I don't think the problem is at the digital uh, level. Um, and just like uh, no matter how many lines of code we write, we could not increase production <laughs> from 2 million a day to 20 million a day. That's um, the specialty of the industry. Uh, we also uh, cannot write some code uh, to, to, to produce oxygen making machines, which is why Taiwan donated oxygen generating machines <laughs> to, to India, right? Um, and, and so I, I think the point here is not uh, think about uh, equitable rationing uh, at this particular point in time, uh, because unlike the PPEs, which really has to uh, ration very <coughs> um, in a very fair manner <coughs> for it to even work, right? The, it, the same goes for the exposure notification system. If you don't get 70 or so percent of people installing it, the Bluetooth-based privacy preferring, uh, pre preserving uh, exposure notification doesn't work. So these are the problem of equitable distribution and the, uh, also the recent SMS checking system is of the same shape, uh, but the oxygen supply is not of the same shape. So I, I'm not exactly sure that crowdsourcing can help here. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is from Mateus. Mateus, are you on? Are you on the call? Yeah, I am. Can Can you hear? Me? Okay. Would you like to ask? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, um, from your examples, it seems that for uh, the the public health problems that the pandemic brought open source and uh, crowd source data were very useful and a key point 
And could you see this playing uh, a part on other uh, social problems that uh, could decrease social inequality uh, or uh, maybe open source being applied to uh, more economic problems? And I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm sure that's clear enough. Um, mm -hmm, it, it is, it is. Well, the, the police conversation we had around UberX eventually uh, led to the legalization of the Multipurpose Taxi Act. Uh, and Uber is now a Taiwan taxi company, the Q Taxi. Um, and it enabled, uh, crucially, the local church and temples to serve on the rural areas without getting a professional taxi company license, but essentially using the Multipurpose uh, Taxi Act uh, to ensure that they can uh, socialize um, their own community transportation in a fair way and gather the data in the social sector. So uh, it's a data collaborative with social sector, again, setting the data norms and do most of the data retention and collection. Um, and, and so the data collaborative uh, insight here, uh, I think is widely applicable, um, especially around things of common concern like climate uh, and environmental sensing. Um, this is the Airbox network, um, primary schoolers in Taiwan. Uh, nowadays are very familiar uh, with these cheap MBIOT systems um, where they measure PM 2.5 and other uh, weather data right to a distributed ledger. <clears throat> and then they don't um, you know, learn GDPR, data controllership, stewardship uh, from some top-down lecture, which is impossible, by the way, uh, but, but by maintaining their own air boxes. And suddenly, the ideas of data quality, stewardship, and controllership made so much sense if you actually have a node in the distributed uh, ledger. Uh, and it's uh, the idea of sustainable development and global citizenship education. And based on this, then a lot of students co-create uh, I think a undergrad co-creates uh, a map uh, on top of which that uh, is like Pokemon Go. You can find the check-in points uh, near you that provides refillable uh, water. So uh, if uh, the system calculates that you may um, suffer from a heat damage soon because of rising temperature, uh, you can get a notification to refill your, your bottle. Uh, and instead of buying new plastic bottles, uh, it also shows how much plastic you saved, like the carbon footprint that you helped reduce. Uh, and then the check-in also enable the community to explore the local agricultural products and the local history uh, and so on. I, I don't think it has yet uh, merged or collaborated with the Wikipedia local places of interest and uh, museum and history project, but it's a natural extension. Um, and so because of that, it inspired people to think about education, not in a way of uh, literacy, which was more about consuming data and media, uh, but rather about competence, which is based on the idea that everybody produce uh, media and data. And when you are a producer, then you learn to um, work with the existing system, the communities, which made the crowdsourcing possible. And that in turn uh, made the economic distribution more fair because you then get the kind of work that is worthwhile to your community and also pays well because it links to uh, the data collaborative that provides more additional value uh, for the aggregated data, which of course Wikimedia knows best, but you probably know the idea. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. So I think we have time for one final question, and we actually only have one more question, and it's from Peter. So I'm going to let you ask that last question. It, it's totally fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, Audrey, I was just. Uh, in some of the interviews that you've given, I was really just struck by the way that you've defined your role. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering um, if you could share some of the thinking that sits beneath those kind of linguistic adjustments that you make in your description. You say, when we see the internet of things, let's make an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. I wonder if you could kind of unpack the philosophy, philosophy that sits beneath that. Certainly. So, <clears throat> and with, with all due credit, this started with a Larry Wall tweet uh, <laughs> and, and Tim Toady. Larry Wall um, tweeted as a linguist, I'm sure, uh, that uh, when, when we see um, singularity, why is nobody um, talking about the plurality, which is already here? So um, it was just so, so inspiring because um, you see, 
uh, when we think about AI and other emerging technologies, it could be positioned either in the place of individuals. And that's quite natural if you think about things in an individualistic manner. But the problem is that it's essentially zero sum and it leads to singularity. Or you can place AI between human beings, between human groups and say, oh, our bandwidth, for example, for democracy was too low because there was no assistive intelligence. There was only three bits per person every four years uploaded call it voting, right? Uh, and so the, the idea is if you think of democracy as a uh, communication system and then put AI and other new technologies in a appropriate technology way, which to me means it could be appropriated uh, by the local people, uh, and then uh, then it's there's no competition. So I guess that the whole idea was this, like had two dogs, right? Um, fighting with each other, <laughs> that the, the link between them can be seen as a prize to be won, right? In a tug of war, or it could be seen as a way to collaborate. All depends on how you look at it. Um, and so taking all the sides, basically extended from kind of two nodes to many nodes or a small world network and so on. Um, and so when I say, you know, when we see internet of things, let's make it internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it share reality. Uh, when we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. It's all pointed to this idea of kind of transcultural um, republic of citizens, right? It's a way to say it's not about one culture canceling another out. It's about the plurality itself uh, used to be um, difficult to see all the sides, but with assistive intelligence, now we can for the first time. Uh, and that uh, shows, for example, that police graph uh, and that illustrate the idea of plurality too. That's fire, thank you so much. Awesome, really, thank you all. Um, we're, we're right at time. Um, so I just wanted to extend a, a thank you so much to Audrey and Toby. This was really, really awesome. And I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to do this. Um, and I wanted to thank Brendan uh, and Nady for logistic support. And then just a big giant, huge thank you to Lin Nguyen who um, set everything up and co coordinated the entire event. Um, we really couldn't have done it without Lin, so thank you. Thank you, thank you live so. long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. <laughs>